transformed into audio by alternative realities.org. Introduction I certify that the following text is the absolute truth and no work of fiction. These are parts of a transcript of an interview I've made with a non-human and reptilian being in December 1999. This female being was already in contact with a friend of mine, whose name is given only with the initials EF. In the text, since some months. Let me declare, that I was all my life a skeptic about UFOs, aliens and other weird things and I thought that EF tells me just dreams or fictitious stories when he talked with me about his first contacts with the non-human being, La Certa. I was still a skeptic when I met this being on December 16 last year in that small warm room in the remote house of my friend near to a town in the south of Sweden, despite the fact that I saw now with my own eyes that she was not human. She has told and shown me so many unbelievable things during that meeting that I can deny the reality and the truth of her words any longer. This is not another of that wrong UFO papers which claim to tell the truth but tell in fact just fiction. I'm convinced that this transcript contains the only truth and therefore you should read it. I had talked with her for over three hours, so the following transcript shows you only shortened parts of the interview because she asked me after the interview not to publish everything she had told me already now. The order of the questions in this transcript is not always the same order in which I had asked them, so it may seem sometimes a little bit confusing to you. It was not easy to delete all the important parts she had asked me to delete from the transcript, so I apologize for the maybe unusual order. I'm in the possession of the entire transcript of the interview. 49 pages with some of my drawings of her body and her equipment, and also of some tapes on which I have the full interview, but I will not reveal this before I have permission from her. I will send this shortened form of the still fascinating document to four of my reliable friends to Finland, Norway, Germany and France and I hope they will translate it into their own languages, and into other languages. And I hope as many people as possible will be able to read and to understand the transcript. If you receive it, please send it to all your friends via email or make printouts and copy them. I certify furthermore, that various paranormal abilities of her species like telepathy and telekinesis, including the moving and dancing of my pencil on the table without touching and the flying of an apple around 40 centimeters over her hands were shown to me during the three hours and six minutes of the meeting and I'm absolutely sure that these abilities were no tricks. The following is certainly difficult to understand and to believe for someone who hasn't experienced it, but I was really in contact with her mind and I'm now completely sure that everything she said during the interview is the absolute truth about our world. Unfortunately, if I read the entire transcript and much more, this very shortened form by myself I have the strong impression, that everything I've written sounds too unbelievable to be true, that everything sounds more like a bad science fiction story from TV or cinema and I have doubts that anyone will believe my experiences. But they are true, if you believe it or not. I can't expect from you that you believe my simple words without evidence, but I can't give you that evidence. Please read the transcript and think about it and you will maybe see the truth in these words. There will be a new meeting between me and her, again in the same house in Sweden, on April 23rd 2000 and she promised me to give me maybe some evidence for her existence. In the meantime I collect questions which I will ask her then. Maybe she gives me permission to reveal more of the missing parts in that transcript and about the coming bore. Believe it or not. This makes no real difference, but I hope you will believe. Ole K. Transcript of Interview, Shortened Version December 16, 1999 Question, first of all, who are you and what are you? Are you an extraterrestrial species or can your origin be found on this planet? Answer, as you can see with your own eyes, I'm not a human being like you and to be honest I'm no real mammal despite my partly mammal-like body features, which are a result of evolution. I'm a female reptile being, belonging to a very old reptilian race. We are the native Durans as we live on that planet since millions of years. 
We are mentioned in your religious writings like your Christian Bible and many of the ancient human tribes were aware of our presence and worship us as gods, for example the Egyptians and the Inca and many other old tribes. Your Christian religion has misunderstood our role in your creation, so we are mentioned as, evil serpent, in your writings. This is wrong. Your race was genetically engineered by aliens and we were just the more or less passive visitors of this accelerated evolution process. You must know, some of your scientists have already supposed this, that your species had evolved in a naturally completely impossible speed within just two, three millions of years. This is absolutely impossible, because evolution is a much slower process if it's natural but you have not understood this. Your creation was artificial and done by genetic engineering, but not by us but by an alien species. If you ask me, if I'm an extraterrestrial, I must answer no. We are native Terrans. We had and have some colonies in the solar system, but we originate on this planet. It's in fact our planet and not yours, it was never yours. Question, can you tell me your name? Answer, this is difficult because your human tongue is not able to pronounce it correctly, and a mispronunciation of our names is very offensive for some of my kind. Our language is very different from yours, but my name is I will try to say it smoother by use of your human letters, something like Shia Shak asks with a very, very strong pronunciation of the S H and K sounds. We have no forenames like you but only a single but unique name which is divided and characterized by the way of speaking and which is given not to children, who have a known children name, but only in a special procedure in the adolescent age at the time of either religious or scientific enlightenment or awareness, as you would call it. I would appreciate it if you don't try to say my real name with your human tongue. Please call me, La Serta. This is the name I generally use when I'm among humans and talk with them. Question, how old are you? Answer, we measure the time not like you in astronomical years and in the revolving of the Earth around Sun, because we usually live beneath the surface of the planet. Our time measurement depends on periodically returning cycles in the Earth a magnetic field and according to this, and said with your numbers, I'm today let me calculate. 57,653 cycles old. I have reached my adult phase and my awareness 16,337 cycles ago. This is a very important date for us. According to your human time scale I am around 28 years old. Question, what is your task? Do you have a job like us? Answer, to say it with your words, I'm a curious student of the social behavior of your species. That's why I'm here and talk to you, that's why I have revealed my real nature to EF. And now to you and that's why I give you all that secret information and why I will try to answer all the questions on your many sheets of paper honestly. I will see how you react, how others of your kind react. There are so many crazies and liars of your kind on this planet who claim to know the truth about us, about UFOs, about aliens and so on and some of you believe their lies. I'm interested to see how your species will react if you make the truth, which I will tell you now, public. I'm quite sure everyone of you will refuse to believe my words, but I hope I'm wrong, because you need to understand if you want to survive the coming years. Question, I've read your full statement, which you have given to EF. About this, but can you give me now just a short answer? Are you folks real flying objects piloted by extraterrestrials or do they belong to your species? Answer, some observed UFOs, as you call them, belong to us, but most not. Most of the mysterious flying objects in the sky are not technological devices but mainly misinterpretations of natural phenomena your scientists have not understood, like spontaneous plasma flares in the high atmosphere. Nevertheless. Some UFOs are real craft belonging either to your own species, especially to your military, or to other alien species or at last to us, but to minority of sighted craft belongs really to us, because we are generally very careful with their movements in the atmosphere and we have special ways to hide our ships. If you read a report about the sighting of a metallic bright grey cigar-shaped cylindrical object with a length of there are different types, 
let me say between 20 and 260 of your meters and if this object had made a very deep humming sound and if there were five bright red lights on the metallic surface of the cigar, one at the top, one in the middle, two at the end, then it's likely that someone of you have seen one of our ships and this means that it was either partly defect or that someone of us was not careful enough. We have also a very small fleet of disc-shaped craft but such UFOs belong usually to an alien species. Triangular UFOs belong generally to your own military but they use foreign technology to build them. If you really want to try to see one of our craft, you should have a look at the skies over the Arctic, the Antarctic and over in Eurasia, especially over the mountains there. Question, have you a special symbol or something like that with which we can identify your kind? Answer. We have two major symbols representing our species. One, the more ancient, symbol is a blue serpent with four white wings on a black background, the colors have religious meanings for us. This symbol was used from certain parts of my society, but it is today very seldom you humans have copied it very often in your old writings. The other symbol is a mystic being you would call a dragon in the shape of a circle with seven white stars in the middle. This symbol is much more common today. If you see one of that symbols on a cylindrical craft I've described in my previous answer or on some underground installation, this thing or place belongs definitely to us, and I would advise you to go away from there as soon as possible. Question, the seven stars in the second symbol you've mentioned, do they mean the Pleiades? Answer, Pleiades? No. Actually. The seven stars are planets and moons and they are a symbol for our former seven colonies in the solar system. The stars are shown in front of a blue background and the dragon circle means the shape of Earth. The seven white stars mean Moon, Mars, Venus and four moons of Jupiter and Saturn, we had colonized in the past. Two colonies are no longer in use and abandoned, so five stars would be more correct. Question. As you have not allowed me to make photos what would be very useful to prove your real existence and the truth of this story, can you describe yourself detailed? Answer: I know that it would be helpful to prove the authenticity of this interview if you can make some photos from me. Otherwise, you humans are very skeptic, that's good for us and for the real alien species acting secretly on this planet, so even if you had such photos, many of your kind would say that they are fraud that I'm just a masked human woman or something like that, that would be very offensive for me. You must understand that I can't give you permission to make photos of me or of my equipment. This have various reasons, which I want not to discuss with you for there, but one of the reasons is the keeping up of the secrecy of our existence, another reason is more religious. Nevertheless, you have permission to make drawings of my look and of my equipment I can show you later. I can also try to describe myself, but I doubt that others of your kind will be able to imagine my real look just from simple words, because the automatic denial of the existence of reptilian species and generally of intelligent species other than your own is part of the programming of your mind. Well, I will try. Imagine the body of a normal human woman and you have at first a good imagination of my body. Like you, I have a head, two arms, two hands two legs and two feet and the proportions of my body are like yours. As I'm female I have also two breasts, despite our reptile origin, we have started to give milk to our babies during the evolution process this happened around 30 million years ago, because this is the best thing to keep the young alive. Evolution had done this for your species already in the dinosaur age and they a little bit later, also for ours. That means not that we are now real mammals but the breasts of us are not as large as those of human woman and the size of them is generally equal for every female of my kind. The external reproduction organs are for both sexes smaller than those of humans, but they are visible and they have the same function as yours, another gift of evolution to our species. My skin is mainly of a green beige color, more pale green, as we have some patterns of brown irregular dots, each dot of the size of one, two centimeters, on our skin and in our face, the patterns are different for both sexes but females have more, especially in the lower body and in the face. You can see them in my case as two lines over the eyebrows crossing my forehead, at my cheek and at my chin. 
My eyes are a little bit larger than human eyes, for this reason, we can see better in the darkness, and usually dominated from the large black pupils, which are surrounded from a small bright green iris, males have a dark green iris. The pupil is slit and can change its size from a small black line to a wide open egg-shaped oval, because our retina is very light sensitive and the pupil must compare this. We have external round ears but they are smaller and not so curved as yours, but we can hear better because our ears are more sensitive for sonic, we can also hear a wider range of sonic. There's a muscle or lid over the ears which can completely close them, for example underwater. Our nose is more pointed and there is a V-shaped curving between the nostrils, which enabled the ancestors to see temperature. We have lost most of this ability, but we can't still feel temperature much better with this organ. Our lips are shaped like yours, those of females a little bit larger than those of males, but of a pale brown color and our teeth are very white and strong and a little bit longer and sharper than your soft mammal teeth. We have no different hair colors like you. But there is a tradition to color the hairs in different ages, and the original color is like mine, a greenish brown. Our hairs are thicker and stronger than yours and they grow very slow. In addition, the head is the only part of our body where we have hairs. Our body, arms and legs are similar in shape and size to yours, but the color is different, green beige, like the face, and there are scale-like structures on the upper legs, over the knee, and upper arms over the elbow. Our five fingers are a little bit longer and thinner than human fingers and our skin on the palm is plain, so we have no lines like you but again a combination of a scale like skin structure and of the brown dots. Both sexes have the dots on the palm, as we have no fingerprints like you. If you touch my skin, you will feel that it is smoother than your hairy skin. There are small sharp horns on the upside of both middle fingers. The fingernails are gray and generally longer than yours. You see that my nails are not so long and drowned at the top. This is because I'm female. Males have sharp pointed nails with a length of sometimes 5 or 6 of your centimeters. The following feature is very different from your body and part of a reptilian origin. If you touch the back side of my upper body you will feel a hard bony line through my clothing. This is not my spine but a very difficult shaped external plate structure of skin and tissue following exactly our spine from the head to the hip. There is an extremely high number of nerves and large blood vessels in this structure and in the plates, which are around 2 or 3 centimeters long and very touch sensitive. This is the reason why we have always problems to sit in chairs with the back like this chair. The main task of these small plates, beside a role in our sexuality, is simply the regulation of our body temperature and if we sit in natural or artificial sunlight, these plates become more blood filled and the vessels become wider and the sun is able to heat up our reptoid blood, which circulates through the body and through the plates, for many degrees and that gives us a great pleasure. What else is different from your kind? Oh, we have no navel, because we were born in a different way to your mammal birth. The other exterior differences from your kind are minor and I think I must not mention all now, because most of them are not visible if we wear clothing. I hope the description of my body was detailed enough. I would advise you to make some drawings. Question, what kind of clothing do you generally wear? I suppose this is not the way you dress normally. Answer, no, I wear this human everyday clothing only when I'm among humans. To be honest, it's not very comfortable for me to wear such tight things and it is always a very unusual feeling. If we are in our own home, this means in our subterranean home, or in our large artificial sun areas and if we are together with others near to our own name, we are usually naked. Is this shocking for you? When we are in the public and together with many others of my species we wear very wide and soft clothing made of thin, light stuff. I have told you that many parts of our bodies are very touch sensitive, mostly the small back plates so we can feel comfortable in tight clothing because it can hurt us. Man and woman wear often the same kind of clothing, but the colors are different for the sexes. Question, you've said, others near to your own name. Do you mean your family? Answer, no, not really. 
You would call it family but with this word you mean only those of your kind which belong genetically together like father or mother and child. As I have said earlier we have a very difficult and unique name. Part of the pronunciation of that name is absolute unique and there is no other being with the same name, but part of this name, the middle part, is pronounced in a way that told the others to which family, I must use the word, because you haven't the right one in your vocabulary, you belong. This means not that all in that group are genetically related to you, because these groups are usually very large and contain between 40 and 70 of us. This group includes generally your genetic relations, except one of them had decided to left this group, and your connection with father and mother is often the strongest. It would be too difficult for me to explain you now our very old social system which is very complex and we would need many hours only for the primary things. Maybe we can meet another time and I can give you detailed descriptions of all these things. Question, have you a tail like normal reptiles? Answer, do you see one? No, we have no visible tail. If you look at our skeleton, there is only a small rounded bone at the end of our spine behind the pelvis. This is a useless rudiment of the tail of our ancestors, but it is not visible from the outside. Oh, our embryos have tails during the first months of development, but these tails disappear before they were born. A tail makes only sense for a primitive species which tries to walk onto legs and must held the balance with the tail. But our skeleton had changed during evolution and our spine is nearly in the same shape as yours, so we need no tail to stay on to feet. Question, you said that you were born in a different way to us. Do you lay eggs? Answer, yes, but not like your birds or primitive reptiles. Actually, the embryo grows in a protein liquid inside the mother's womb, but there is also an egg-shaped but very thin chalk all around it that fills the whole womb. The embryo inside this hull is completely autarky from the mother's body and it has every substance it needs to develop inside this chalk hull. There is also a cord like your navel cord which is connected to a point hidden behind the back plates. When the baby is going to be born, the whole leg is pressed through the vagina covered in a slimy protein substance and the baby came out of this soft egg after some minutes. These two horns on our middle fingers were instinctively used from babies to break through the chalk hull to take their first breath. Our young are not so large as your babies when they were born, they are between 30 and 35 of your centimeters tall, the egg is around 40 centimeters tall, this is because our vagina is smaller than a human one, but we grow to a normal size of 1,60 to 1,80 meters. Question, what about your body temperature? You've said that you enjoy to lay in the sun. What effect has this to your organism? Answer: We are no mammals and as reptiles our body temperature depends on the temperature of our surrounding. If you touch my hand you will maybe feel that it is colder than yours, because our normal body temperature is around 32-33 degrees Celsius. If we sit in the sun, especially naked and with a row of small back plates in the sun, our body temperature can rise for 8 or 9 degrees within minutes. This rise causes a production of many enzymes and hormones in our body, our heart and brain and every organ becomes more active and we feel than very, very good. You humans only enjoy being in the sun but for us it is the greatest pleasure you can imagine, maybe like your sexual excitement. We also enjoy swimming in very warm water or other liquids to rise our body temperature. If we are for some hours in the shadow, our temperature goes back to 32-33 degrees. This can cause no harm to us, but we feel much better in the sun. We have artificial sun rooms in the underground but this is not the same for us like the real sun. Question, what do you eat? Answer, generally various things like you, meat, fruit, vegetables, special kinds of mushroom, from subterranean farms and other things. We can also eat and digest some substances which are poisonous for you. The main difference between you and us is that we must eat meat, because our body needs the proteins. We can live completely vegetarian like your kind because our digestion would stop working and we would die after some weeks or maybe months without meat. 
many of us eat raw meat or other things which would be disgusting for you. Personally, I prefer cooked meat and surface fruits like apples or oranges. Question, can you tell me something about the natural history and evolution of your species? How old is your species? Have you evolved from primitive reptiles as mankind has evolved from apes? Answer, oh, this is a very long and complex story and it sounds certainly unbelievable to you, but it's the truth. I will try to explain it in short. Around 65 million years ago, many of our unadvanced ancestors from the dinosaur race died in a great global cataclysm. The reason for this destruction was not a natural disaster, an asteroid impact as your scientists believe falsely, but a war between two enemy alien groups that took mainly place in the orbit and high atmosphere of your planet. According to our limited knowledge about the early days this global war was the first alien war on planet Earth but it was definitely not the last, and a future war is coming soon, while a cold war, as you call it, between alien groups is ongoing since the last 73 years on your planet. The opponents in this 65 million year old war were two advanced alien species, whose both names are again not pronounceable for your tongues. I'm able to say them but it would hurt your ear if I tell you the names in their original way. One race was humanoid like your species, but much older, and was from this universe, from a solar system in the star constellation you call Procyon today in your maps. The other species, about which we know not so much, was a reptilian species, but they have nothing to do with their own species, because we have evolved from local Saurians without exterior influence except the successful manipulation of our own genes by us. More about that later. The advanced reptilian species came not from this universe but from a, well, how should I explain it to you? Your scientists have not really understood the true nature of the universe, because your illogical mind is not able to see the easiest things and relies on wrong mathematics and numbers. This is part of the genetic programming of your kind to which I will come later. Let me say, that you are nearly as far away from the understanding of the universe as you were 500 years ago. To use a term you will maybe understand, the other species came not from this universe but from another bubble in the foam of the universe. You would call it maybe another dimension, but this is not the right word to describe it correctly. By the way, the term dimension is generally wrong in the way you understand it. The fact you should remember is, that advanced species are able to walk between bubbles by use of, as you would call it, quantum technology and sometimes in special ways only by use of their mind. My own species had also advanced mental abilities in comparison to your species, but we are not able to do the matter string slash bubble changing without technology, but other species active on this planet are able and this looks to you like magic as it had to your ancestors. Back to our own history. The first species, the humanoids, had reached Earth around 150 years before the reptilians and they built some colonies on the former continents. There was a large colony on the continent you call Antarctica today and another one in the continent you call Asia today. These people lived together with animal-like saurians on the planet without problems. When the advanced reptilian species arrived in this system, the humanoid colonists from Procyon tried to communicate peacefully but they were not successful and the global war started within months. You must understand that both species were interested in this young planet not for his biology and undeveloped species, but for only one reason, raw material, especially copper. To understand this reason, you must know that copper is a very important material for some advanced species, even today, because it is, together with some unstable materials able to produce new stable elements if you induce a high electromagnetic field in the right angle with a high nuclear radiation field to produce an overcrossing of fluctuating fields. The fusion of copper with other elements in such a magnetic slash radiation field chamber can produce a force field of special nature that is very useful for various technological tasks, but the base for this is an extremely complex formula you are not able to discover because of the restrictions of your simple mind. Both species wanted to have the copper of planet Earth and for this reason they fought a not very long war in space and orbit. The humanoid species seemed to be successful during the first time, 
But in a last battle the reptilians decided to use a mighty experimental weapon, a special kind of fusion bomb which should destroy the life forms on the planet but should not harm the valuable raw materials and the copper. The bomb was fired from space and detonated at a point of your planet you call, Middle America, today. As it detonated in the ocean, it produced an unpredictable fusion with hydrogen and the effect was much stronger than the reptilians had expected. A deadly radiation, an overproduction of fusion oxygen, a fallout of different elements and a nuclear winter, for nearly 200 years were the result. Most of the humanoids were killed and the reptilians lost their interest on the planet after some years for, even for us, unknown reasons, maybe because of the radiation. Planet Earth was on its own again and the animals on the surface died. By the way, one result of the fusion bomb was the fall out of different elements and materials created in the burning process and one of those materials was iridium. Your human scientists today see the iridium concentration in the ground as an evidence for an asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs. That is not true, but how should you know that? Well, most of the dinosaurs died, not all in the detonation but in the bad things which came after the war, especially in the nuclear winter and in the fallout. Nearly all dinosaurs and reptilians were dead within the next 20 years. Some of them especially those in the oceans were able to survive for the next 200 to 300 years even in this changed world, but these species also died, because the climate had changed. The nuclear winter ended after 200 years, but it was colder on Earth than before. Despite the cataclysm, some species were able to survive, fish, like the sharks, birds, little creepy mammals, your ancestors, various reptiles like crocodiles, and there was a special kind of small but advanced dinosaurs which had developed together with the last large animal reptilians like the species you call Tyrannosaurus. This new reptile was walking on two legs and looked a little bit like your reconstruction of an Iguanodon. It originated in this family, but it was smaller, around 1.50 meters tall, with some humanoid features, a changed bone structure, a larger skull and brain, a hand with a thumb which was able to grab things a different organism and digestion, advanced eyes in the middle of the head like your eyes and most important, with a new and better brain structure. This was our direct ancestor. There are theories that the radiation from the bomb took part in the mutations of the organism of this new breed, but this is not proven. Nevertheless, this little humanoid-like dinosaur evolved during the following 30 million years, as I have said earlier. A species need generally more time to evolve than you think, if the evolution is not artificially induced like in your case, from an animal to a more or less thinking being. These beings were intelligent enough not to die in the next millions of years, because they learned to change their behavior, they lived in caves instead in the cold nature and they learned to use stones and branches as first tools and the use of fire as help to warm them, especially to warm their blood which is very important for our kind to survive. During the next 20 million years this species was divided by nature into 27 subspecies. Unfortunately, former reptilian species were prone to divide themselves in a more or less illogical way into subspecies during the evolution process. You can clearly see this in the unnecessary high number of animal dinosaur species in earlier times, and there were many, mainly primitive, wars between the subspecies for dominance. Well. Nature was not very friendly to us and as far we know from the 27 subspecies 24 were extinct in primitive wars and in evolution, because their organism and mind was not developed enough to survive and, as main reason, they were not able to change their blood temperature in the right way if the climate changed. 50 million years after the war and after the end of dinosaurs, only three, now also technological. Advanced reptilian species were remaining on this planet together with all the other lower animals. Through natural and artificial crossbreeding these three species were united to one reptilian species and through the invention of genetic manipulations, we were able to eliminate the dividing prone genes in our genetic structure. According to our history and belief, this was the time when our final reptilian race, as you see me today, was created by use of genetic engineering. 
This was around 10 million years ago and our evolution nearly stopped at this point. Well, actually there were some minor changes and are looked or more humano. Humanoid and mammal-like appearance during the coming ages, but we have not divided again into subspecies. You see, we are a very old race in comparison to your kind, which was jumping around as small monkey-like animals in the trees at this time while we invented technology, colonized other planets of the system, built large cities on this planet, which disappeared without a trace in the ages, and engineered our own genes while your genes were still those of animals. Ten million years ago the small simians started to grow and they came down from the trees to the ground, again because of the change of the climate, especially on the so-called African continent. But they evolved very slow as it is normal for a mammal and if nothing extraordinary had happened to your kind, we wouldn't be able to sit here and talk because I would sit in my comfortable modern house and you would sit in your cave clothed with fur and trying to discover the secrets of fire, or you would maybe sit in one of our zoos. But the things had developed differently and you believe now you are the crown of creation, and you can sit in the modern house and we must hide and live beneath the earth and in remote areas. Around 1,5 million years ago, another alien species arrived at Earth. It was surprisingly the first species since over 60 million years. This would be more surprising for you if you would know how many different species are today here. The interest of this humanoid species you call them a legim today, was not the raw material and the copper, it were to our astonishment the unadvanced ape humanoids. Despite of our presence on this planet, the aliens decided to help the apes to evolve a little bit faster, to serve them in the future as some kind of slave race in coming wars. The fate of your species was not really important for us, but we didn't like the presence of the illegim on our planet and they didn't like our presence on their new. Galactic Zoo, Planet and so your sixth and seventh creation was the reason for a war between us and them. You can read about that war for example partly in the book you call Bible in a very strange way of description. The real truth is a very long and difficult story. Should I continue? Question, no, not now. I've made some notes about your history and now I have some questions. Answer, please ask. Question, first of all, you handle with a very large time scale. You claim that your primitive ancestors lived together with the dinosaurs, survived the, as you called it, artificial cataclysm and evolved in over 40 million years and your evolution was completed 10 million years ago. This sounds very unbelievable to me. Can you say something to this? Answer, I understand that this must sound absolutely unbelievable to you because you are a young and genetically engineered species. Your historical horizon ends at a scale of just some thousands of years and you think this is right. But it isn't. This is impossible. Your programmed mind is obviously not able to handle with such large time scales. Our evolution time may seem incredible long to you, but this is in fact the original way of nature. Remember. Your early mammal ancestors developed together with dinosaurs and they survived the bomb like us. They evolved slowly during the next millions of years and they divided into various species and shapes, some of them larger, some of them smaller. This is evolution of the body. But what about their mind and intelligence? They were simple animals. The mammals evolved since let us say, 150 millions of years, but only in the last two. Three millions of years they were able to become intelligent and thinking. And within this small period beings like you were created. From nature? 148 millions of years time for the evolution of animal like mammals, two millions of years time for the development of, more or less, intelligent beings like you. Ask yourself, do you really think this accelerated evolution is natural? Then your species is more ignorant than I've thought. We have not evolved wrong but you. Question, I understand. But I have another question. You've mentioned many facts about the ancient war between the aliens 65 million years ago. This happened very long before your kind became really intelligent, as far as I have understood you. Why do you know so many things about that, first war, and about the evolution of your species? Answer. This is a good question, much better than the previous, 
and I have not explained it properly to you. Our knowledge about the first war comes completely from an ancient artifact, which was found around 16,000 years ago from our archaeologists on the continent you call North America today. They found there a round plate with a diameter of approximately 47 of your centimeters. The plate was made of an even for us unknown magnetic material and inside the plate there was another smaller crystal plate which contained an enormous amount of information coded in the molecular structure of the crystal. This, memory plate, was manufactured from the last bomb survivors of human race from Procyon already 65 million years ago but it was completely intact when we found it. Our scientists were able to encode the messages and data and so we heard the first time about the events which took place in the distant past and which led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. The plate contained detailed descriptions of both species, but more about the humanoids, and about the events and weapons, including the fusion bomb. It contained also a description of the animals and saurians on Earth, including our pre-intelligent ancestor species. The rest of our knowledge about our evolution comes from skeletons and from the backreading and dislash encoding of our DNA. You see, we know the real truth about our roots since 16,000 years. Before that time, there was a more religious idea of our creation. Question, what have happened with the both alien species? Answer, we don't know exactly. The surviving humanoids on Earth obviously died in the years after the bomb and others of their kind and the reptilians never came back to Earth, as far as we know. Concerning the reptilian aliens, there is a possibility that it was physically impossible for them to return, because the matter between bubbles is sometimes in rapid movement. The current theory is, that both species had ceased to exist during the millions of years. Question. You've mentioned skeletons of your kind. How can it be, that human scientists haven't found any trace of you and your ancestors if you really live for such a long time on this planet? We have found many skeletons of primitive dinosaurs, but none of an advanced reptilian being with a larger skull and brain and a hand with a thumb as you have described it before. Answer, yes, you have. But your great scientists were not able to reconstruct the skeletons completely because they wanted to reconstruct reptilian animals, not intelligent beings. You would laugh if you would know how many of the, especially small, Assyrian skeletons in your museums are totally wrong constructions of never existing beings, because you used many bones which didn't really belong together and sometimes you made artificial bones if something was missing you needed to construct an animal Saurian. Many of your scientists are aware of this problem, but they don't make it public because they can explain it and they claim that the right bones were just missing and the reconstruction is right. Many bones of us were used for Iganodon reconstructions, for example the hands with the visible thumb, look at an Iganodon in a museum and you will see that I'm right. A scientist in the country you call the United States had built a nearly correct skeleton of our kind some years ago, but the local government, which is partly aware of our existence, confiscated the reconstruction. As we live today, and since thousands of years, nearly completely beneath the earth, you will not find any cadavers or skeletons of us. Question, you speak sometimes about underground cities and artificial sunlight. Do you mean something like a, hollow earth, with this? Is there a second sun inside our planet? Answer, no, earth is not really completely hollow and there is no second sun inside. This story is ridiculous and physically not possible, even your species should be intelligent enough not to believe this. Do you know how much mass a sun must have to produce energy and light for a longer time by fusion? Do you really think that there could be a small act of sun inside the planet? When I talk about our subterranean home, I talk about large cave systems. The caves you have discovered near to the surface are tiny in comparison to real caves and huge caverns deeper in the earth, in a depth of 2,000 to 8,000 of your meters, but connected with many hidden tunnels to the surface or to surface near caves, and we live in large and advanced cities and colonies inside such caves. Major sites of us are beyond the Arctic, the Antarctic, Inner Asia, North America and Australia. 
If I talk about artificial sunlight in our cities I don't mean a real sun but various technological sources of light, including gravitational sources, which illuminates the caverns and tunnels. There are special cave areas and tunnels with a strong UV light in every city and we use that places to heat our blood. Furthermore, we have also some surface sun places in remote areas, especially in America and Australia. Question, where can we find such a surface near entry to your world? Answer, do you really think I will tell you their exact location? If you want to find such an entry, you have to search it by yourself, but I would advise you not to do that. When I came to the surface four days ago, I used an entry approximately 300 of your kilometers north from here near to a large lake, but I doubt that you would be able to find it. There are only a few entries in this part of the world, more or far more north and east. As a little advice, if you are in a narrow cave or in a tunnel or even in something that looks to you like an artificial mine shaft and as deeper you walk as smoother appear the walls and if you feel unusual warm air streaming from the depth or if you hear the rushing sound of streaming air in a ventilation or elevator shaft, then look for a special kind of artificial and smooth wall somewhere in the cave with a door made of grey metal. If you would be able to open that door, but I doubt this, you would be in a usually round technical room with ventilation systems and elevators to the depth. This is probably an entry to our world. If you have reached this point, you should know that we are now definitely aware of your presence. You are already in big trouble if you have entered the round room but you should look for one of the reptilian symbols on the walls. If there are no symbols or other symbols, you are maybe in bigger trouble as you think, because not every underground installation belongs to our kind. Some new tunnel systems are operated from alien races, including hostile races. My general advice if you find yourself in a, for you, strange underground installation, run away as fast as you can. Question. You mentioned earlier that you use the name Lassiter when you are among humans and that you enjoy it to be in the real sun on the surface of Earth. But how can you be among humans? You don't look like us, so anyone will see that you belong to another species. Why have nobody seen and described a being like you if your kind lives already since our creation together with us on the same planet? Can you explain that to me? Answer. First. My kind was of course seen and described, and worshipped, many times in your primitive past, for example in your religious writings like your Christian Bible. You can find descriptions and even simple drawings of us for also in the southern part of the American continent on various temples. So-called wise men from India and from the Asian mountains have described our species many times in writings, together with other wise men from the African continent. I think we are the most mentioned non-human species, maybe beside the Elegim, in your history. If you don't believe me, have a look at your history and you will see the truth in my words. Your great scientists called the belief in us superstition and religion and today's intelligent humans have forgotten our presence on the surface in the past. Furthermore, our species is seen even today sometimes from human witnesses in its original shape on Earth or in our surface near entries in tunnel systems, but fortunately you and your media didn't take the reports of such crazy serious, that's good for us and that's the reason why we allow those people to see us as we really are. Some of my species are also in direct contact with human scientists and politicians from the surface, but this is top secret as you would call it and nobody of your public knows anything about it. The matter of these meetings is generally the upcoming war with and between the alien species and our assistance in this war. But there is also another explanation, why we can walk among you and why you are not able to recognize us, mimicry. The following may again sound unbelievable and even shocking to you, but as you have asked I will explain it. I have told you before that we have more advanced mental abilities than your species and with, more advanced, I mean, that we are able to use telepathy and telekinesis from our birth on, in fact, mother and newborn child communicate generally with telepathy during the first months, without special training as you needed to activate these sleeping parts of your brain. 
The structure of our brain is a little bit different to yours and our hypothesis is larger and more active than yours, especially when we are in sunlight. Our own abilities are very strong in comparison to yours, but weak in comparison to the matter string slash bubble mind forces of some of the alien species on this planet. I was never very good in that mind things, but we all have these primary abilities and can use them for example for our protection or even for attack. When we are on the surface as we meet human beings, even a large group of them, this makes no difference. All of your minds are like one mind, we are able to touch their mind and induce them via telepathy the command, see us as one of your kind, and the weak human mind will accept this order without refusion and they will see us despite our reptilian look, as normal humans. I've done this many times and you weak humans generally see me as an attractive brown-haired woman, because I have created this special, mimicry image, in my mind years ago and I can induce it into your minds without problems. I've needed some time at the beginning to learn the use of the mimicry correctly, but then it worked nearly automatically and I can even walk among a group of yours and nobody will recognize what I am. There is a simple switch, see us as we really are see us as we want you to see us, and your consciousness which was placed there from the illogym when they created your kind and we can use this switch to convince you that you see humans when you look at us, other aliens use this switch, too. It is easier as you think. When there are meetings between your kind and aliens which seem to look exactly like yours. These aliens have used that switch in some of the meetings with men like aliens can be also explained with meetings with my kind. When I met EF. The first time, he saw me also as a normal human woman and I remember that he was very frightened and shocked when I revealed him my real appearance. Question, do you mean, that you can really make me believe that I talk now with an attractive brown haired human woman instead of a reptilian being like you? Answer, probably but I don't think so in your special case. When someone expects to see a human woman instead of me, I can do it without problems with his mind, even with large groups, because nobody expects to see a reptile woman. But I have allowed your mind to see me in my original appearance from our first meeting on and I have never induced something into your mind, so you have already realized that I'm not human. If I would now try to change this, it would probably lead to an absolute confusion or to unconsciousness and I don't want to harm you. As I have said I'm not very good in these things. Question, that's very scary. Can you kill with those abilities? Answer, yes, but it's forbidden. This means not that it was not done in previous times. Question, have both sexes these abilities? Answer, yes. Question. What about photos? How do you appear on photos? Answer. This is a silly question. I appear on photos as a reptile being, because I can't have influence on the photo or on the camera itself but only on the photographer's mind. If he or she would develop the film and show the photo to others, they would see me in my original shape. That's the reason why it is forbidden for our kind to be filmed or photographed and we must avoid every camera on the surface. That is very difficult and we were filmed sometimes in the past without our knowledge, especially from certain of your governments and secret agencies. Question, what other commands can your kind induce into our minds? Something like, serve us, or obey. Answer, this is again a strange question. We are not your enemy, most of us not, so why should we do this? To answer your question. It depends on the strength of the human mind and on the strength of the sending reptilian. There is no, serve us, or, serve me, switch in your mind, so such a command is much more difficult to induce. If the human mind and consciousness is weakened their reptilian inducer is experienced in these things and was some hours in the sun before he or she tries to do it, then it could probably work for a certain time. There are secret teachings about such things, but I've never learned anything about it. I use my primary abilities for mimicry and for communication with my own kind and sometimes for other private things, but I've never used it to harm humans or their mind. I would appreciate it if we can end with this topic here. Question, a last question, you've said earlier, that you can hide your UFOs. 
Do you use the same abilities to do this? Answer. Yes, but on a technical base. There is a powerful device inside each craft which is able to send an artificial signal to your minds to convince you that you see either nothing but only the sky or that you see normal aircraft like planes instead of our ships. This isn't used very often, because we avoid human public when we move in the atmosphere. If you are able to see our UFOs it means that the device is either defect or deactivated for some reason. The camouflage effect didn't work on photos. To answer this possible question of you already in advance, but why should someone make a photo of the sky when he could not see anything unusual there? By the way, most of the surface near entry points to our tunnels are also hidden with such a device and your kind will generally see only normal cave walls instead of the door. That's one reason why I've said that I doubt that you will be able to find such a secret door to our world, but it have happened a few times in the past. Question, back to your and our own history. You've mentioned the race of the Illajim who have created our human race. From where did they come and how did they look like? What had exactly happened when they arrived? Are they our god? Answer, the Illajim came from this universe, from the solar system you call Aldebar and in your maps. They were a very tall humanoid species with usually blonde hairs and a very white skin, they avoided the sunlight because it hurt their skin and their eyes. This was absolutely unbelievable for a sun-loving species like us. They seemed to be intelligent and peaceful at the beginning and we started a more or less friendly communication with them, but later they showed their real intentions and plans, they wanted to evolve the apes to a new breed and we were a disturbing factor for them on their new zoo planet. At first, they caught around 10,000 or maybe even 20,000 of your simian ancestors and they left the planet for some hundred years. When they returned, they brought your, now more human, ancestors back. Then they left Earth again for some thousands of years and the primitive pre-humans lived together with us without major problems, they were just afraid of our aircraft and technology. The Elegym had taught their mind and enhanced their brain and their body structure and they were now able to use tools and fire. The Elegym returned within 23,000 years seven times and accelerated the evolution speed of certain of your kind. You must understand that you are not the first human civilization on the planet. The first advanced humans, who lived at the same time with less developed pre-humans, because the Elegym had experimented with different speeds and stages of evolution, with technology and speech existed around 700,000 years ago on this planet. Your scientists have not understand this, because they found only the bones of the pre-humans in some primitive cave drawings showing advanced humans and flying devices. This genetically advanced human breed lived together with us, but they avoided contact with my kind, because the Elegym teachers had warned them with misleading purpose that we are evil beings and that we lie to them. Well. After some centuries the aliens decided to extinct their first creation and they accelerated the evolution of a second and better test series and so on and so on. The truth is that your modern human civilization is not the first on this planet Earth but already the seventh. The buildings of the first breeds are lost, but the fifth civilization was the one, which built the large triangular constructions you call, Egyptian pyramids. Today around 75,000 years ago, your Egyptians just found that large ancient pyramids in the sand and tried not very successful to build similar constructions, and the sixth civilization was the one, which built the cities which ruins you can find today beneath the sea in the so-called Bimini area around 16,000 years ago. The last creation of the seventh breed, of your series was done just 8,500 years ago and this is the only creation you can remember and to which your religious writings refer. You rely on archaeological and paleontological artifacts which show you a wrong and short past, but how should you know anything about the six civilizations before? And if you find evidence for their existence, you deny and misinterpret the facts. This is partly a programming of your mind and partly pure ignorance. I will tell you in the following only about your creations, because the six previous mankinds are lost and therefore they should not concern you. There was a long war between us and the Illegim and also between certain groups of the Illegim themselves, 
because many of them were the opinion that the again and again creation of human species on this planet makes no real sense. The last battles in this war were fought around 5,000 years ago in orbit and surface. The aliens used powerful sonic weapons to destroy our underground cities but on the other hand we were able to destroy many of their surface installations and bases in space. The humans of your series were very frightened when they observed our battles and they wrote it down in form of religious myths, their mind was not able to understand what was really going on. The Elijim, who appeared as gods for the sixth and seventh breed, told them that it is a war between good and evil and that they are the good and we are the evil race. This depends certainly on the point of view. It was our planet before they arrived and before they started their evolution project with your kind. In my opinion, it was our right to fight for our planet. It was exactly 4,943 years ago, according to your time scale, that the Elijim left the planet again for unknown reasons. This is a very important date for us, because many of our historians called it a victory. Fact is that we don't know what had really happened. The Illajim were gone from one day to another, they vanished without a trace together with their ships as we found most of their surface installations destroyed by them. The humans were on their own and your civilization developed. Many of us were in contact with certain, more southern, tribes of your species in the coming centuries and we were able to convince some of them that we are not the evil the aliens wanted them to believe. During the time from 4,900 years ago to today, many other alien species arrived the planet, some of them used the old teaching and programming of your mind and played again God for you, but the Elijim themselves never came back. They had left the planet for a duration of some thousand years also earlier, so we expect their return one day in future too and their project or two may be extinct also the seventh breed, but we don't really know what have happened to them, to answer this question of you in advance. Your current civilization doesn't know anything about your real origin, about your real past, about your real world and universe and you know very little about us and our past. And you know nothing about the things to come in your future. As long as you will not understand and believe my words, I tell you the truth because we are not your enemy, as long there is danger for your species. Your enemies are already here and you have not understood. Open your eyes or you will be in big trouble soon. If you haven't believed anything of the things I've told you before, then you should really believe and remember this. Question, why do you think I don't believe you? Answer. I have a certain feeling that you don't believe me, despite the fact that I'm sitting here in front of you. Everything I have told you in the last two hours is the absolute truth about our world. Question, how many alien species are active on Earth at the moment? Answer, as far as we know 14 species. 11 from this universe, 2 from another bubble and 1 very advanced from a very different plane. Don't ask me for names because nearly all are not pronounceable for you, eight of them are not pronounceable even for us. Most of the species, especially the more advanced, are just studying you as animals and they are not very dangerous for you and for us and we work together with some of them, but three species are hostile, including the one which was in contact with some of your governments and exchanged their technology for copper and other important things and which had betrayed your kind. There was and is a cold war between two of these hostile races during the last 73 years and the third species seemed to be the winner in this useless struggle. We expect a more hot war between them and you in the near future, I would say in the next 10 or 20 years, and we are worried about that development. In the last time, there were some rumors about a new 15 species which had arrived on Earth just 3 or 4 years ago but we don't know anything about their intentions and we were not in contact with them till now. Maybe the rumors are wrong. Question, what do the hostile alien races want? Answer, various raw materials, including copper for their technology, your water, or better the hydrogen in your water, which is a source of energy in advanced fusion processes, and certain chemical elements in your air. Furthermore, Two of the species are also interested in your body, in your human tissue and blood, because their own genetic structure is defect through bad evolution and radiation, 
as far as we know, and they need intact strings from your kind and from animals to repair their own genetic again and again, but they are not really able to repair the defects completely because their DNA and your DNA is not fully compatible, my own species is absolutely incompatible with them, so they are not very interested in us and they try to make more compatible crossbreeds between you and them by use of artificial fertilizations and artificial wombs. We suppose that the coming war between the three races or between you and one or all of them will be fought for raw material, hydrogen, air and DNA. Question, is this the reason for the abductions? Answer, partly, especially when the aliens took egg and sperm samples from you. Sometimes the abductors belong to another and more advanced race and they just want to study your body and your mind, which is more interesting for some of them than your solid body, as you would study a primitive animal. As I have said, three alien species are hostile and this means that they do not care for your fate or for your life and people who were abducted by them came very rarely back alive. If someone is able to report about an abduction, it means in my opinion that he or she has not met one of the aggressive species or that he or she is a very, very lucky human to be alive. Advanced and friendly races also took sometimes egg and sperm samples, but for other reasons. Question, you've said there are only 14 species active on Earth. But why describe people who saw alien beings so many different and bizarre types of them? Answer, I think I have already answered to this question. As I have said, most of the alien races have much more advanced mind abilities than you or even me, there is just one alien race completely without such abilities. They are able to appear in your mind and memory as whatever they want and this induced image has nothing to do with their real appearance. You remember them as normal humans or great dwarfs or even extremely bizarre animals because they want you to remember that or sometimes they want you to completely forget anything about a meeting with them. Another example, you can for example remember that you were just in a normal of your human hospitals and that some doctors were examining you and you think not further about what have happened to you, maybe till you discover that there is no hospital in the street where you supposed it, but in fact you were examined by them in one of their laboratories. You can rely on your mind in this case. They appear in different shapes to you to confuse you and to make so-called abduction witnesses who are able to remember the events, or who believe they are able to remember, ridiculous in the public and as far as we know, they are successful. Believe me, there are only 14 alien species on this planet and only 8 of them abduct humans at the moment, again as far as we know. In addition. Not every one of your abductees is one and some of the aliens in the reports are really just imagination or lies. Answer, how can we protect us against this influence on our mind? Question, I don't know. I doubt you can, because your mind is like an open book to read and write for nearly every species I know. This is partly the guilty of the illegitimate themselves, because they had constructed or better misconstructed, partly intentionally your mind and your consciousness without real protection mechanisms. If you are aware that someone tries to manipulate your mind, you can only concentrate on that suspicion and try to analyze every one of your thoughts and memories. Very important, don't close your eyes, this would lead to a different form of brain waves which are more easy to access, and don't sit or lay down to rest. If you stay awake during the first minutes, you can maybe try to filter the other thoughts and waves in your brain and the inducer will give up after some minutes if he or she is not successful because it will start to hurt his or her own brain. This is very difficult and certainly painful and it can harm you, so better don't try to resist but it would be the only possibility you have. However, you can try this only with the more weaker species, not with the strong. Question, what do you mean with? One species comes from a very different plane. Answer, before I can explain that correctly to you, you must be able to understand the universe and this would mean a maybe useless teaching of your mind, including the removal of some barriers, of many weeks and with teaching I mean not only teaching by words. I have said this with your word plane or level because you have again no better word in your vocabulary. And dimension would be in this case absolutely wrong. It's rather wrong even for another bubble, 
because a dimension can't exist without planes. If you would be a species living in another or over the plane and if you would be furthermore able to enter planes without technology so that your body is not made of that kind of matter you know, then you would be the mightiest being you can imagine. This very advanced race I've mentioned had developed outside of here and they've evolved in fact over billions of years. They would be able to destroy all of you and us and everything with just a single thought. We were in contact with them only three times in our whole history, because their interest in your planet is different from that of all other races. They are definitely no danger for you or us. Question, what will happen when the war begins? Answer, this is difficult to answer. It depends on the enemy race and on their tactic. War is not always that primitive thing you humans mean with the word. War can be fought on various levels. One possibility they have is the destruction of your social system by influence on political leaders. Another is the use of advanced weapon systems which can cause earthquakes or volcanic eruptions or other disasters, including weather disasters, which may seem natural to you. The special fields from copper fusion I've mentioned earlier are able to have an influence on your global weather. I think they will not attack the planet directly before the human civilization is weak, because even you have possibilities to destroy their craft, but not many. Let me say, that we are not absolutely sure if there will be really such a hot war already in the next years. I don't want to talk further about this. Question. This is the end of the interview. Do you want to say a last sentence or message? Answer. Open your eyes and see. Don't believe only in your wrong history or your scientists or your politicians. Some of them know the truth about various things, but they don't inform the public to avoid confusion and panic. I think your species is not as bad as some of my kind thinks and it would be a pity to observe your end. That's everything I can say. Go through your world with open eyes and you will see, or maybe not. Your kind is ignorant. Question, do you think anyone will believe that this interview is the truth? Answer, no, but it is an interesting experiment for my social studies. We will meet again in some months and you will tell me then what have happened after the publication of my message. Maybe there is hope for your kind. All rights reserved copyright. The Law Certifile I. Translation by Doug Parrish. Taken from http colon slash slash www.sabin.org slash rectiloid slash index 4.html. Introduction. I once again reaffirm that the following text is the absolute truth and is not fiction. It was composed from three original tape recordings which were made on April 24, 2000 with a tape recorder during my second interview with the reptilian creature known as, La Certa. At La Certa's request, the original text of 31 pages was revised and shortened up to deal with some questions and answers. Some existing questions were partially shortened or amended. It was even undertaken to extract message and significance from it. This part of the interview, either not mentioned or not mentioned completely in the transcript, deals primarily with personal issues, paranormal demonstrations, the social system of their reptilian species and alien technology and physics. The reason for the shifting of the date and time of the second meeting was a possible observation and surveillance of my own person after the publication of the first transcript. Although everything was attempted on the advice of Lasser to, to keep my identity a secret, just two days after the dissemination of the document abroad, and various unusual events took place. Please don't think that I am paranoid, however, I believe that the publication of the interview has drawn either official attention or the attention of some organization to me. Up until this time. I usually regarded people to believe that they were being followed by the state to be nothing more than jokers. But now I have begun to revise my ideas on that since events in January. It began with the failure of my telephone for several hours. When the phone became operational once again, there were quiet echoes and strange clicking and whirring sounds when I made calls. A defect could, ostensibly, not be found anywhere. Overnight. Important data disappeared from the hard drive in my computer. The testing program reported, defective sectors, 
where strangely enough there were only data which dealt with illustrations and completed textual material from the interview. These, defective sectors, also contained material of a paranormal nature in the field of my research. Fortunately, the material was also stored on floppies. In addition I discovered by pure chance some hidden data in a likewise hidden directory index. The name which appeared on the data and the directory index was e 70 to Uj. A friend, who was a computer expert, could not make anything of this designation, and when I was about to show it to him, the directory index had disappeared. One evening, my apartment door was standing wide open. My TV set was running and I am absolutely confident that I had turned the TV set off. A minivan with British markings and the imprint of a Europe-wide supermarket chain parked in front of my house. I noticed the same minivan again on several occasions traveling at a distance behind my car, even when I visited the town of 65 kilometers away. When I returned, the car was on the other side of the street once again. I never saw anyone get into or out of the car. An act on the door of the vehicle and on the tinted windows caused no reaction of any kind. After about two weeks, the minivan disappeared again. When I informed DF personally about these events, he suggested that I change the place and date of the meeting in order to assure our own and Lasserta's safety. The meeting took place on April 27, 2000 in another isolated location. It was unobserved as far as I can determine. Once again, all of this may sound strange and paranoid, like a fantasy from a cheap science fiction film, however, I can only repeat to and assure the reader once again, all of this is the unadulterated truth. Believe my words or don't believe them. These things have happened and they will continue to happen, whether you believe it or not. Until it is too late. Our civilization is in danger. Ole. K. May 3rd 2000. Transcript of the interview, shortened version date of interview, April 27, 2000. Comma comment by Ole. K. The meeting began with an appraisal of diverse questions and opinions which I had gotten from readers of the first transcript in anonymous fashion through distribution from my trustworthy friends. Some of these opinions altogether there were over 14 pages of paper contained comments shaped by everything from a radically religious to a fanatical tendency to welcome contact with a reptilian species. Some of these comments contained stereotypical phrases like, servants of hell, or, species of the evil one. I don't want to go into any kind of detailed description here since I don't want pass on further any false and radical realm of thought. Question. When you read these religious and animosity-ridden comments here, what do you think and feel then? Is the relationships between your species and ours really shaped from that kind of total negation? Answer: Does it amaze you that I am not completely angered by that? I had fully expected those kinds of extreme reactions. The programming for the utter negation of another species, especially the reptilian species, as in your own cases deeply embedded in each of your own individual consciousnesses. This ancient conditioning stems from the days of your third artificial creation and, biologically speaking, is passed down as an information genome from generation to generation. The identification of my species with the powers of darkness was a primary intention of the Elegim who liked seeing themselves in the role of the powers of light something which in and of itself represents a paradox since that humanoid species was extremely sensitive to your sunlight. In case you were expecting me to act offended, I guess I'll have to partially disappoint you. These obscure intentions are not really your fault, you are simply following for the most part what you have inherited from your ancestors. It is indeed actually somewhat disappointing that many of you develop no especially strong individual self-conscience, for this would help you to overcome the conditioning. As I already said, we were in direct contact in the last several centuries with some of your more primitive human tribes, these tribes had themselves succeeded in breaking through the old, creation programming, they were able to meet us without tension, hate and total rejection. Apparently many of your modern civilized individuals are not in a position to think on their own, but rather let themselves be guided by programming and religion, 
which is also a manifestation of that ancient programming in part and parcel of the plan of the Elegim. Therefore, comments of that kind died sooner regard as amusing than irritating, they simply confirm in large measure for me my suppositions about your defined mode of thinking. Question, therefore, you are not the species of the evil one, as was remarked earlier? Answer, how am I supposed to answer that? Your people still think according to a simple and completely inappropriate scheme of generalizations. Simply put, there are absolutely no purely evil species. There exist in every terrestrial and extraterrestrial species alike both good and evil individuals, it's even true of your own people, but there is no such thing as an absolutely evil species. This conception is really very primitive. You people have believed from time immemorial what you are supposed to believe what was foreseen for you to believe by your creators. Every well-known species, even the more highly developed ones, consists of a great number of individual consciousnesses, at least a portion of the consciousness is individual, even though there are connecting fields of consciousness, these self-sufficient spirits are able to decide freely for themselves a lifestyle which is either good or evil, according to your own human standards. It depends again on the respective point of view, your people are not necessarily in a position to judge whether the deeds of a much more highly developed species are good or evil, because you stand at a lower observation point, from which an assessment is not possible. Your simple words good and evil are in any case examples of a tendency towards generalization, in my language there are many a concepts for the various shades of meaning of individual behaviors in comparison to the norms of a society. Even those extraterrestrial species which are inclined to act with antagonism towards you are not, species of the evil one, even though they operate negatively with respect to your own race. They do this for their own reasons and do not regard themselves as evil, were your structure and way of thinking more linear and more focused as theirs is, then you would also behave in such a fashion. The attitude of a species towards other kinds of existence naturally depends very heavily on its respective structure and way of thinking, each species sets its own priorities. To classify that as good or evil is really quite primitive, for the survival of any species argues for many varieties, among them your own, as well as for even the most varied of the worst or negatively directed deeds. I won't even exclude my own kind in this regard for there have been certain occurrences in the past which I don't personally welcome, but about which I would also not like to go into detail. None of these occurrences have happened in the last 200 years of your time scale. But please note the following, there are no absolutely good and there are no absolutely bad species, because each and every species always consists of individuals. Question, in letters that I got, there was often the question, whether you could go into any greater detail regarding the advanced physics that you commented on last time. Many people said, your words made no sense. For example, how do UFOs function, how do they fly, how do they perform the maneuvers that they do? Answer, I ought to explain that to people? That's not all that simple. Let me think about it for a minute. I always have to use very simple words in order to make clear to you the basic principles of a higher kind of science. Let's try this, you have to be clear about some fundamental facts. The very first thing is that you must divide up the conception of the physical world because each existence consists of different layers, let's say for simplicity's sake that it consists of a material illusion and a sphere of influence, translators note, no legitimate translation exists for this word Feldrum. Feld means, field, rom means, space, room, expanse. Therefore, I'm translating it as, sphere of influence. Comma certain physical conditions are associated only with the realm of the material, as in concrete, while other and more complicated conditions are associated only with the sphere of influence of the material world. Your conception of the physical world is based upon a simple material illusion. That illusion is further subdivided into three elementary or basic conditions of matter. A fourth and very important condition also exists, which you simply pay attention to more or less as you choose, it is the one bordering on the sphere of influence or plasma realm. For you, 
the theory for a controlled transformation or an elevation of the frequency of matter in the stable existence of this fourth aggregate condition of matter is not very common, or it exists at a very primitive level. As an aside, there are simply five states of matter, but the post-plasma state would really be going too far and it would only serve to confuse you. Besides, it is not necessary for an understanding of the basic theory. It is connected with diverse phenomena which you would characterize as paranormal. Now, back to the essentials, plasma. Now, with plasma I don't mean just hot gas, as the concept is generally simplified by your people but rather I mean a higher aggregate condition of matter. The plasma state of matter is a special form of matter which lies between its real existence and the sphere of influence, that is a complete loss of mass and pure accretion of energy of various form whenever matter is pushed or shoved. Comment Note, no explanation was given for the use of the word pushed, shoved, as used in this context. Your guess is as good mine. The fourth state of matter is very important for certain physical conditions which can be used for example too. How should I express this to you? Generate anti-gravity. That's a rather strange human word and not really correct, but you ought to understand it better this way. Essentially, in the world of real physics, there are no bipolar forces, but rather only, observer-dependent reflective behavior, of a single, large unified force at different levels. With anti-gravity or the displacement of gravitational characteristics into levels, one can, for example, cause apparently solid matter to levitate. This method is employed partly by us and by extraterrestrials as well as a means of propulsion for their UFOs. You people are moving on a really primitive level towards a similar principle for your secret military projects, but since you have more or less stolen this technology, and it was later falsely passed on to you intentionally by the extraterrestrials, you lack the real physical understanding. As a result, you have to struggle with problems of instability and radiation with your UFOs. According to my information, there have been a great number of deaths of your people because of intense radiation and field disturbances. Don't you agree? This is also an example of the business regarding the question of good and evil. You people play with unknown forces and thereby accept the death of colleagues of your own kind, for they are dying for a greater cause, namely, for the advancement of your technology which as a result is being put into place once again for the purpose of war, that is for negative pursuits. Now, one can give you the benefit of the doubt, that only the least number of your kind have any knowledge about these alien projects which are, as you explain it, top secret. It was told to you that the higher the ordinal or ranking number of basic matter, the simpler the heightening of the condition, but that is only partially correct. If you can't circumvent these powers, then you're better off not attempting it. But your kind has always been ignorant and has from time immemorial tried to play around with forces which you have not even understood. Why would that ever change? You remember this business of copper fusion? By means of the fluctuation at the right angle with the induced radiation field, copper is fused with other elements. The illusion of matter is fused, the fields in the sphere of influence overlap each other but the main force would be reflected by that process and would assume a quasi-bipolar character. The resulting connection in the field would therefore not be stable in the normal condition of matter and unsuited for tasks. As a result, the entire field spectrum is shifted to a higher plasma-like condition, whereby the spectrum comes together with this harsh shifting to the opposite pole side the word is not correct, of the force field and it resembles quite closely a gravitational shift. This shifting causes a tilting of the repulsing quasi-bipolar force, which now no longer flows to the interior of the force field, but rather flows partly to the exterior of the field. The result is an interstratifying reflective force field which is very difficult to modulate within certain technical boundaries in relation to its own characteristics. It can also carry out a multiplicity of tasks, as for example, causing massive flying objects to be levitated and maneuvered. It can also exert a camouflage function in the realm of electromagnetic radiation as well as manipulate temporal sequences of events indeed only to very limited extent and other things as well. Are you familiar with your 
quantum tunnel effect. Even the amplitude equalizations among genuine matter can be achieved with one of those kinds of fields if the frequency and the distance from the plane of the field are high enough. Unfortunately, the whole thing that I have explained to you in your words has come out to be rather primitive, I'm afraid. It sounds rather strange and certainly impossible for your comprehension, but perhaps this simple explanation can be of some use to you in helping you to understand. But then again, maybe not. Question, is there a scientific substantiation from paranormal powers, as for example with your powers of thought? Answer, yes. In order to explain that, one has to acknowledge the physical reality of the sphere of influence, fell the draw. I'll try to do it. Wait just a second. You are going to have to separate yourself mentally from the illusion that that which you see is the true nature of the universe. It is, at best, the surface of a side. Imagine for yourself that all the matter here you, this table, this pencil, this technical device, this paper does not really exist, but that it is rather only the result of a field oscillation and a concentration of energy. All matter that you see, every creature, every planet and star in this universe, has an information energy equivalent in the sphere of influence which is located on a main field the general level of things. Now, there is not only one level, but several. Last time, I had mentioned that highly developed species which is capable of changing levels, which is something completely different from the simple bubble changing, for bubbles are a part of each and every level. Do you understand? Dimensions, as you call them, are a part of a solitary bubble, bubbles or universal foam are a part of a level, and levels are layers in the sphere of influence, while the sphere of influence, acting in the capacity of single physical size, is essentially unending. It is composed of innumerable information energy layers and general levels. There are in the sphere of influence known all levels, all are the same, but they are separated by means of their energy conditions. I notice that I am confusing you now. I think I ought to stop with this explanation. Question, no, please continue. How do concrete paranormal powers arise? Answer, well, okay then. Let's try something simpler. Again, it is not completely correct, but let's begin in this manner. Tangible matter on this side is mirrored in the sphere of influence, fell drum, as a field with distinct layers. These layers contain information, as an example, about the simple structure of matter or the string frequency, but also there is stored information stemming from the development of matter. Are you familiar with the human concept of morphogenetic fields? One part of the layer could be designated as such. Now there is still another intermediary layer for which you unfortunately have no human concept, since the theory is not common in human thinking. Let's call it a paralayer, for this layer is mainly responsible for everything which you call sign paranormal and which lies outside the boundaries of your primitive science. This paralayer lies between the layers of matter and the morphogenetic layers of the field and the sphere of influence. It can actively integrate with both. Your body, for example, is mirrored as a field in the sphere of influence, fell the draw. That doesn't mean that it does not also exist here as well as flesh, blood, bones, and the form of matter strings or atoms, but not only that. Existence is always a duality. Some layers of the field contain simple information about the solid matter of your body and its frequency, while other layers, contain information about, your spirit, your consciousness or, speaking from a human religious point of view, your soul. Awareness or consciousness in this case is a simple energy matrix, divided into different layers of your field and the sphere of influence nothing more, nothing less. Genuine awareness can also exist here on the matter side, but only in the form of post-plasma, the fifth form of matter. With the necessary physical knowledge and the corresponding technology, the consciousness slash awareness matrix, or soul, can also be separated from its field of rest. It can, despite its removal, continue to exist in a self-sufficient manner for a certain amount of time. That has the strange occult name of, soul robbing. But above all, we're talking about science here, not about magic or dark forces. 
comma comment by Ole. K. The soul robbing was mentioned in one of the radical, religiously motivated comments in connection with the reptilian species. But back to your question, creatures with more powerful mental powers can have a direct influence on the paralayer by means of their consciousness slash awareness fields. Now this layer is not limited only to the individual, but rather as a part of a general information layer you could call it in a prosaic sense the community soul, that is connected with all animate and inanimate matter and all consciousness which exists on this main level. The biological cause for these abilities lies on the side of matter, by the way, in the pituitary gland, which always is in the position to generate the frequencies to actively control the sphere of influence, fell the draw. Even you people could theoretically do this, however, you are solidly blocked in these things. As I have said, the paralayer can interact with mind as well as with matter. For example, if I decide to use my mental powers once more in order to move this pencil, then, simply said, I imagine in my mind how my consciousness slash awareness expands slash amplifies itself on the matter side in the form of post plasma to the pencil. In the sphere of influence this causes simultaneously an automatic command from the consciousness slash awareness layer to the paralayer to interact with the matter layer of the pencil. Since the paralayer is not confined to the body, it is not even a problem that the pencil lies over there, for I can unerringly reach it, even without moving my matter body. Post plasma on this side, paralayer on the other. I have control over the pencil and the interaction brings the matter field of the pencil to the point where it changes in the manner in which it moves, for example. Comma comment by Olay K, I certify that the pencil mentioned above abruptly at that very moment jumped into the air to a height of 20 centimeters and then fell back to the surface of the table. The sound is clearly heard on the recording tape. No one visibly had touched the pencil. Question, that is fascinating. Which kinds of paranormal activities can one generate with that? Answer, all kinds. Everything that you call paranormal. As I said, this special layer lies in the sphere of influence, fell drop, between the morphogenetic information layers and the matter layers and can interact with respect to both sides. That is to say, it can be interacted with solid matter as well as with mind or mental information wherewith we can achieve everything that is generally designated as telekinesis and telepathy. The connection absorption with another consciousness slash awareness is generally separate in the procedure from the simple influence of matter, since different consciousness slash awareness fields work with different oscillations. A consciousness slash awareness that sends or a consciousness slash awareness that listens must first adapt itself to the other mind exactly before any access is possible. Most species also have chances to block the alien access, but you people don't have this. The following is generally valid, the stronger the paranormal abilities of a species, the simpler the adaptation and the access. Our own abilities are not so powerfully developed, therefore, first we have to learn specifically alien mind influence in order to use our mimicry. For example where mimicry is actually quite simple in your minds due to the implanting of the on slash off switch. Some of these abilities are also partially inherited, mother and child of my kind as an example are attuned exactly during the first months of life partially also in the egg covering in the expectant mother, and communicate telepathically. In order to influence you people, we need a certain amount of time for practicing, despite your simple structure. Therefore, it is forbidden, for example, for adults of my kind before the age of enlightenment, to come to the surface of the earth. That term is synonymous, along with other things, with full physical strength. In the case of not fully developed abilities, the danger of discovery by you would be too great. By the way, there are of course numerous secret teachings about the real possibilities which can give one these abilities but I really don't know anything exact about that. Whenever an alien mind ought to be influenced, then there are some generally valid steps, which are set into motion by other extraterrestrial species. First and foremost, the alien oscillation must be felt, something generally that is done automatically by the brain, that is for the one the field oscillation, 
For the other the quasi-electrical brain waves here in the normal space, which matter inhabits. That is not especially difficult. After that, one simply probes for the other consciousness slash awareness in the mind with the post-plasma manifestation, the sphere of influence, Feldrom, reacts and the connection is there. Now one can read out information from the first one and record the desired information to the second one in the correct location. You asked me last time whether you people have the opportunity to protect yourselves against this influence, and I told you that only an awakened concentrated mind had any kind of a chance to withstand it. In this state of mind the oscillations change very abruptly and access becomes complicated, more precisely, it can come as a painful recoil. Whenever you close your eyes, then the field becomes flat, and alien access to the mind is immediately possible and without restriction. In terms of your chances against a more highly developed species, you have none at all. They are able to adjust the oscillations faster than you can change. I could even demonstrate it on you, but you were really horrified and confused the last time, so we'll just leave it at an explanation. This explanation presumably sounds to you like as you say, something esoteric or from the occult or magic. The reason for that is simply that you lack the basic understanding for seeing the background reasons. All paranormal phenomena have a purely scientific origination. None of this has anything to do with supernatural powers. We grow up with this kind of knowledge, we know how one makes use of these powers, and where they come from. We are acquainted with theory and practice. You are not. Therefore, you really don't understand what happens in your world you see only one side of existence, not the other, I mean here both that are physical. Everything paranormal is dualistic, and it exists in the space that matter inhabits as well as in the sphere of influence, fell the draw. To be explained. It can only be explained by the acceptance of the latter, because the sphere of influence, fell drum, is the basis. I would welcome an end to the scientific question since you really aren't grasping them anyway. We're wasting more or less valuable time by doing this. Question, only one last question. At our first meeting in December, you made it quite clear that you didn't want to discuss scientific and paranormal concerns. By the openness now. Answer, the last time I saw really no necessity in overburdening you with facts of that kind and now you are obviously overburdened. Therefore, I had preferred only to mention these topics in a peripheral sense. Apparently, however, some of my performances today have set you to thinking about your world, something that can't be all bad. And by the way, your human scientists will tend to regard my comments as, humbug. And so I see no great danger in spreading this information widely. No one will pay much attention to it. By the way, the words of people who have characterized me as a creature of evil have their basis in the belief in occult powers and magic both of which things do not exist. There is no magic, only highly developed science, and everything that you label as magic is only a part of science. If you would only comprehend that, then you would be a step ahead in your development. My openness on this issue ends here. Pose other questions, please. Question, good. Let's talk about UFOs. Can you explain to me how our governments came into possession of UFO material to the point that they could start their own projects? Did it have anything to do with the Roswell incident? Answer, yes, but that incident was not the first one. I am no historian, I am studying only your current behavior, so my knowledge about those events in your history is presumably not very extensive. I will try to explain to you what I know about those things which happened at that time. Let me think about it for a second. In the years 1946 to 1953 in your time scale, there were five cases where extraterrestrial ships crashed to the surface of the Earth. In that crash what you call the Roswell incident, there was not only one alien ship involved, but two that crashed after a collision in different parts of the land in the west the one you call the USA. You have to know that the ships of this particular species can remain levitating in the air for a particular period of time even though they are damaged, that accounts for the spatial difference, 
in their crash locations. These were indeed not the first crashes, but by that time the second and the third. Another ship had crashed in 1946, but it was destroyed beyond usability. One thing first before the explanation, it certainly sounds ridiculous to you that such highly developed extraterrestrial ships simply crash, and that a relatively large number did so in a relatively short amount of time. The explanation for that is likewise more than strange, but it is correct. It does not lie in the ship's drive itself, but rather in the direction of the field to your planet. The species that we are discussing and it was always in this time period that this species used a disc-shaped craft, used a propulsion system which ran according to the normal principle of fusion, to be sure, but one that at that time employed a more than unconventional method for field alignment. This method had various advantages but also disadvantages. The repelling field must of course lie in the absolute correct angle to the surface of the Earth. This species used an alignment technology in their ships, with which the field locked into place all points of the Earth's magnetic field. Now at that time this species had just arrived on the Earth and their point of origin lay on a planet with a more stable magnetic field, for which they had developed and aligned their drive. The magnetic field of the Earth is not really all that stable, it is subject to cyclical variations and it forms field eddies under unfavorable conditions. Whenever a ship with one of those kinds of drives gets into a field fluctuation or into an eddy that is too strong, then for a short time the repelling field can no longer align itself correctly and the ship glides uncontrolled on its flight path. The drive is operating correctly, to be sure, but the field fluctuates in all directions and because of that, the ship can crash. In the case from 1947 which you addressed, it is my understanding that one of the ships got caught in a fluctuation, its field linked up unintentionally with that of its squadron leader and it collided with another ship whereby both of them were heavily damaged. The cause for the magnetic fluctuation at that time was probably an electrical disturbance brought about by a weather event. Both ships crashed as a result, one of them fell near the collision point, the other a hundred of your kilometers or so distant. All occupants were killed in the impact. The thin hull structure of that kind of disc craft is in and of itself not very stable, since those discs have not been designed for crashes as well as for flight in a field where there are exterior forces at work. Now, your human military collected the individual pieces at first until they discovered the whole ships with the dead creatures aboard. Immediately, they classified everything as, top secret and brought them to their military bases in order to analyze the drive. The secret endeavor was to set the alien technology in place later against evil enemies of that great country. That is as primitive as it is ridiculous. I believe I remember I don't want to specify exactly your date that it was probably between 1949 and 1952 that there was a rather bad accident during some research being done on one of the wrecks. According to what I heard what members of my species were told by members of that government it resulted in an unintentional activation of one of the drive's components in the unshielded condition. As a result, for a very short period of time how should I phrase this there was an unchecked shift of the environment to a plasma-like condition, which on the other hand, through a very, very unfortunate accident, caused an overturning of the general power field into a magnetic pulse of immense power. Do you have any idea what kind of an effect a plasma magnetic jolt has, when it comes into contact with an organism? No, how should you know that? Of course you don't. Disturbance in the structure of the field and bioelectric feedback. Imagine, if you will, a human body which is engulfed in bright flames for three or four of your days. Those flames apparently do not go out and they burn the body right down to its last constituents. Well then you have an approximate impression of what happened. I think that 20 or 30 of your scientists were killed in that lab. Two further crashes occurred in 1950 and 1953 in the water catchment area of the American continent. Those ships were able to be recovered from the crashes relatively intact. The one in 1953, as I remember, even had an intact drive core. 
It was by means of that device that you saw for the first time that you had understood the entire concept fully and correctly and that you had reconstructed it fully and correctly. Even today you still don't have it right. That species, which had built the ships in the first place a species which I, by the way, count among those who are unfriendly towards you, was naturally worried about the investigation of their own technology by your kind. They did not want, however, at that early point in time, to begin direct conflict with you, and so they chose the diplomatic path and came into contact with that government during your 1960s. Of course, they did not divulge the real reasons for their being here copper, hydrogen, air, but rather they pretended to be curious researchers and offered to show people the functioning principle of the ships whereby they would expect in return some favors. Simple-minded as you are, you of course agreed to it. And were deceived. You gave them raw materials, you gave them secured locations for their bases, you gave them access to your most secret defense data, you gave them access to your DNA and much more and all just to quench your greed for power and information. The alien species of course quickly noticed that they were dealing with simple-minded creatures and they gave you false and inferior information about their technology so that they receive much more out of the collaboration than your kind do. For example, they gave you information that the drive can only be constructed with unstable elements of a higher ranking number, but they withheld the information that the field drive can be constructed with various modifications to work as well with stable elements of a lower periodic number, and generally, that's the way it's done. Through these half-truths they made you dependent on the synthesizing of high, numbered, elements, and thereby renewed by their own technology. Their clues to the construction of your UFOs were laid out in such a way that the solution to old problems caused new problems to arise simultaneously. They never told you the complete truth, but always built in again and again clever lies, which later lead to technical problems and to your dependence on them. In the last years of your 1970s and your early 1980s, it finally came down to various events between the alien species and that human government. I don't want to go into detail here since there is much that even I'm not exactly sure of. The whole thing lay in the context with some new, or better said, the old technical problems with your own self-constructed ships whose camouflage and drive partially failed to function in test flights in the open. Because of that, the function of secrecy was threatened. Your military and your politicians slowly very slowly came to the conclusion after more than 20 years of this that they had been deceived by that alien species. Multitudinous incongruities and the overstepping of bounds of the treaties by both sides finally led to an altercation between you and the extraterrestrials, which culminated in the lift-off of three of the alien aerial objects through a special how do you say it? Amp, electromagnetic pulse, weapon and a military skirmish at one of their underground installations. As a consequence of these attacks, the alien species ultimately withdrew from all contact with you and was understandably more than angered about your kind. Therefore, I count these extraterrestrials among the three groups who are hostile towards you, and while the other two are more occupied with their own business, among them waging a cold war for dominance on your planet, your old friends and partners are preparing to supply themselves finally with the sole and absolute dominance over raw materials and human DNA. At the moment it is probably true that they lack some of the technical possibilities and the large amount of forces which they need in order to achieve their goals directly. In spite of that, we are counting on negative actions possibly ever of a more subtle kind, against you in the next few years or decades. Question: Will the other extraterrestrial species undertake nothing against these war-like actions? Specifically. Something ought to be on Earth for the more highly developed species. Answer, you're wrong there. Specifically, for the more highly developed species there is simply at the very least your fate. You are animals for them. Animals in a very large lab. Understandably, an alien intervention on your planet would disturb their projects, but I don't think that they accept the confrontation with other species for it. 
Many of them could look for another research planet for themselves or they could study over long distance your behavior and your consciousness slash awareness, since crisis situations could have an attraction for their studies. Whenever you people take a look at an anthill, and another person comes along and steps on the anthill, what do you do? You go on your way, or you search for another anthill or you observe the ants in their crisis condition. But would one of you even though he were larger and more powerful than the one who stepped on the anthill in the first place, defend the meaningless ants? No. You have to imagine for yourself the viewpoint of the more highly advanced creatures. You are the ants. Don't expect any help from them. Of course we would also ask for help when it became clear that your old partners were ganging up on you. Some members of that human government are fully aware of our existence also partially owing to an old religious basis. For example, there is a gigantic partially underground building in the capital which is totally dedicated to my species and that also has a direct approach to an elevator shaft and to an underground system. In this building partial meetings have taken place and do take place between us and humans. We have passed on information to you in the last few years. According to what I know, we will keep ourselves as far away from the conflict as we can. You ought to learn to solve your own problems yourselves or to become intelligent enough never to create those kinds of situations. What will come and who will possibly place themselves on your side, only time will tell. I really do not want to make any indications about that. Question, I have here five prints of different UFOs, which claim to show UFOs. Can you take a look at the pictures and tell me in which of them actual extraterrestrial aerial craft can be seen? Answer, I can't try it. You pose many questions to me today which even I cannot answer unequivocally. Don't overestimate my knowledge, I'm no expert in alien technology and the construction of extraterrestrial ships. To be sure, there are mostly some technical details and peculiarities about genuine UFOs with whose help one can easily differentiate them from natural phenomena or human forgeries. You falsify sometimes the pattern of genuine ships, therefore, it is not so easy simply with absolute certainty to identify an object. I'll try it. Show me the photos. Comma comment by Olay K. She considered the pictures respectively for only a couple of seconds and then sorted out photos 1, 3 and 5. These three pictures here are obvious counterfeits or erroneous identifications. In the one picture, it certainly seems to me that a real existing ship of an alien species was adapted for a small model here. It lacks important characteristics which are tied in with the technically and physically associated field. Generally speaking, a picture is all the more a fake, the clearer the outline and the colors are because a levitating ship is generally hidden in a shifted field condition that even distorts the colors or the forms according to alignment. It might perhaps sound strange, but hazy and spectrally shifted photos are sometimes to be interpreted as an indication for a possibly authenticity. By the way, this object is floating above the water. If it were a genuine ship, we would have to see in any case either a trough or a swell on the surface. Since the surface is flat, it is obviously not a genuine ship. In my opinion, none of these three pictures show genuine objects in flight or UFOs. Here in this picture I see above all no artificial object in flight, it seems much more to deal with only a light reflex in your simple optical cameras. You really ought to be intelligent enough not to fall for a mix-up like that. When your general public chases counterfeits and frauds for a long time, then they will presumably discover too late, what is really going on in front of them in their atmosphere. Photo 2, Albiosk, France, 1974. This one seems to be genuine, at least it displays the necessary characteristics. I would assign it at first glance to an alien species who have been visiting your planet for the last 35 years or so. The object itself is metallic and disc-shaped. Certainly it is distorted in form and color by means of a field effect. These four white and very long processes on the underside of the ship itself portray a kind of quasi-gravitational light manipulation, that is the universal force field is being shifted in the direction of a simulated gravity. Actually, 
It is not a genuine light, it is mostly not a genuine light whenever you see illuminating UFOs, but a special strongly charged form field which manifests itself in the space that matter inhabits as a quasi-light. The reason for the activation of the special high energy system in an atmosphere is not completely clear to me, it's possible that it is a kind of investigating or influencing of the environment. In any case, it is terribly careless of that species to allow this technology to be photographed by humans. Well, I guess that most of you just plain don't understand it, and those who do will not say anything about it to the general public. Photo 4, Petty Rechain Belgium, 1990. This is in fact a genuine aerial object, it is in no way extraterrestrial. Triangular aerial objects in flight are simply not used by alien species, or not in this form, at least. That streamlined kind of form is a human concept. It is one of your own secret military projects that you build with the help of immature alien technology technology that was handed over to you by the extraterrestrials during the 1960s and the 1970s. Generally, the form of the hull for a genuine extraterrestrial ship is of no consequence, for inside the field itself there are no exterior forces that have any effect there, in general. The ships have a rounded off form and they are built without hard edges as a disc or a cylinder, so that the field can flow more easily. Your projects decree that along with the alien dry field there also be a conventional jet engine system, therefore, they are always triangular and built thus with streamlining in order to be steerable with this primitive recoil principle. In the example here the ship glides above all on its genuine field drive. Do you see the distortion and the quasi-light in the rotating cylinders? That is an unmistakable indication for the authenticity of the photo. But why, you might ask, are there four cylinders? That's unusual even the interval seems to be incorrect. The coloring is very dark and the interior optical distortion is very noticeable. Presumably a reconstruction of the original system by your scientists. Since the alien species has just not given you any more information since the disagreement, they are rebuilding the system single-handedly without actually being able to understand what kind of dangerous thing they are doing there. This construction does not make the system better, only more unstable. Both of the forward cylinders are too close to each other, they will definitely flow into each other. The color shows me a powerful residual radiation. It was probably the case that high elements were used again as customary for the shifting. It is in any case very dangerous to be unshielded in the vicinity of the field. Did the person who took the photo display any kind of radiation and burn damage? Question, I don't know. Where do these military UFOs come from? From the United States? Answer, yes. I think generally that's true. From the western continent. Question, why then do they fly over thickly populated areas of Europe? This photo comes from Belgium. That doesn't make any sense. Can you explain? Answer, why is it that only I am able to explain strange human deeds? It's possible that these are long distance tests or tests with the electromagnetic camouflage systems. The old enemy of the American nation is on this side of the world. So why shouldn't they test here? At home they've had enough time to have had their ships crossing back and forth. Maybe they have aroused too much observation there. With one of those kinds of unstable field structures as your photo indicates, I consider it somewhat improbable that that ship is capable of making a flight of that length over the ocean. It's possible there is a test station here on your continent. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about it. Question. Many readers of the first transcript have posed the question how your original contact with EF came about. I already know the story from your narratives, but could you repeat it here once again for this volume and for the new transcript? Answer, of course. Now, the story began about two of your years ago here in Sweden. I have been strongly interested in your species and your behavior since my youth, I had already studied your literature at that time as well as possible. Naturally, it is not easy in my homeland to come into possession of human books, 
but since my group or family stands in a higher ranking order, I was able to gather some material together and sometimes to speak with others of my kind who have already been in contact with you. I was really very curious about your species and as soon as I was allowed to come to the surface, I attempted to assemble more information immediately, above all, it was expressly forbidden for me to commence direct contact with humans because in my position at that time, there existed no necessity for doing so. It was in your year 1998, when I was on my way further north from here in the remote forests in the vicinity of the entrance to my world and was looking for biological specimens, which we use in order to watch over environmental pollution and destruction of your flora and fauna statistically by your own kind. At the time, I was already on the return path to the entrance we can even orient ourselves more easily, by the way, through our senses to the Earth's magnetic field and already in the vicinity of the large lake, when much to my surprise I came across a cabin in the woods. In this cabin I sensed a human consciousness slash awareness. It was EF. Actually, I had no permission for contact with another species but by the same token I had set in place my mimicry capability quite successfully prior to this even with larger groups of you, I had never ever come across a human being when I was alone. Now, let's call it primitive curiosity, I wanted to talk with the person in this cabin and so I knocked on the door. He opened the door and we got into an interesting conversation. His language was not quite yet common at that time for me. But it's not all that hard to learn a new language when one can read the information in the consciousness slash awareness of the opposite individual. I simply told him that I came from a foreign country in the East. Of course at the time, he did not really recognize who I was, he was totally convinced that he was talking with a creature of his own kind, although it was simply only a mimicry image. Since my assignment anyway had as its goal an investigation of this terrain which was to last for several days, I visited him in the span of time three times as a human person. At first we talked mainly about really ordinary things, later we got into religious and physical topics. He seemed to be impressed by my knowledge, and I was likewise impressed with his clear thoughts and his for a human being well displayed personality structure and his own opinions. You really like giving yourselves over completely to a public opinion or conditioning, as for example, reptilian species are evil, and stuff like that. I steered the conversation in this direction, and EF said something to the effect that he believed in alien species and that they did not have to necessarily be evil, but perhaps only different than his kind are. That pleased me. At that juncture of time, of course. I could not speak concretely with him about my knowledge because he wouldn't have believed me he would have taken me for a human practical joker. I cultivated the very, very unusual idea, for my kind, to show him my true exterior, something that I did during our conversation at our fourth meeting in the cabin. Actually, he was predestined for contact, he was open-minded, honest, intelligent, not religiously inclined or conditioned. He lived alone and isolated, and no one would believe him, should he decide to go public with his story. I dared to take this step, but then I had serious doubt about the propriety of my act, especially when he reacted. Very. Violently. He got control of himself again after a time and we could finally talk concretely about definite matters. Now he had no choice but to believe me. This was the beginning of a series of meetings which initially took place there in the woods, but later took place in his remote residence. Finally he brought you into contact with me. And for that reason we are now sitting here once again and talking about things which probably won't be believed out there in human society. Question, you said, you would not have had permission at that time for contacts with human beings. Do you now then have permission to talk with the F? and me about all these things and even to make this scientifically public? Answer, yes. That is difficult to explain and for you to understand. Let's just say, I find myself in the position now to arrange this permission without having to take into account any consequences. In this position I am quasi-immune against certain restrictions. Let's look at that way. Yes. Question, 
If other people want to come into contact with your kind, do they have a chance to do so? Answer, generally not. We avoid contact with you and we operate on the surface only in remote areas and there we use the mimicry techniques in case we should meet some people. That I am talking with you now does not mean that others will follow my example. It goes without saying that you could try to find an entrance to my world and penetrate your way into there. However, that can sooner lead to unpleasant consequences for the infiltrator. You have next to no chances on the surface of recognizing us. You can't even contact us directly, we have to contact you, just as I did with EF. Those kinds of contacts however are not the rule but are very rare occurrences. Question, can you describe your subterranean homeland location? Answer, I can attempt to do so, but I certainly will not tell you where this place is located. My homeland lies in one of our smaller underground settlements to the east of here. I'll give you some numbers so that you can make a better impression for yourself. Just a minute. I have to try to convert the measurements approximately into your units. It is a dome-shaped cavern at a distance of about 4,300 meters from the Earth's surface. The cavern was organized as a colony about 3,000 years ago. A major portion of the ceiling structure is artificially integrated into the rock and the form was remodeled into an almost elegantly proportioned and very flat dome with an oval ground plan. The diameter of the dome according to your measures is about two and a half kilometers. The height of the dome at the highest point is about 220 meters. Underneath that highest point in every colony there stands a special whitish grey cylindrical building a kind of supporting column which holds the honeycomb net carrying structure of the dome. This building is the tallest, largest and oldest in the entire dome for it is always situated as the first construction together with the security of the ceiling. In the meantime of course there were times when it was completed and reconditioned. That building has a very special name and religious significance. We have only one of those columns, larger colonies even have more columns according to the construction of the ceiling. One of the main colonies in Inner Asia has as an example nine of those kinds of supports, but that colony is also over 25 of your kilometers in size. The central building is generally a center of religion, but also a center for climate control, and a center for the behavior and the regulation of the lighting system. We have at our location altogether five large artificial light sources which generate your UV light and its warmth through gravitational sources. The air shafts and the light systems from the surface likewise run through these columns and naturally, they are very intensely controlled. By the way, we have three air shafts and two elevator systems there, and even a tunnel connection to the next main colony which lies approximately 500 kilometers to the southeast. One elevator shaft leads to a cavern near the surface, the other leads to one of our depots for the ships you remember, the cylindrical ships, that is naturally concealed closer to the surface behind the rocky mountain face. Normally, there are only three ships there it's a small depot. The other buildings of the colony are, for the most part, concentrically ordered in oval circles around the main supporting column, and they are without exception much flatter generally only between 3 and 20 meters tall. The shape of the buildings is round and dome-like. The color is even differentiated according to circle and distance from the main column. To the north of the column, there is an additional, very large but very flat round building. This building interrupts the concentric system of the colony with its diameter of about 250 meters. It is the artificial sun zone in which specially illuminated corridors and rooms are housed. In these locations very powerful UV light predominates, and they are used in order to warm our blood. There is even a medical dispensary and a meeting room located there. Beyond the outer ring of the colony, there are zones in which animals are kept you know, we must consume flesh as nourishment and the gardens in which plant nourishment and mushroom culture are cultivated. There is also hot and cold running water there from subterranean sources. The power station is located on the edge of the colony. The station is driven by fusion as its base and it supplies the colony and the suns with energy. My group or family lives, by the way, in the fourth ring of buildings out from the central support column. 
so much in such a short time. To describe to you all the buildings and their tasks would be going too far. It is difficult to describe something like that to you, for it is a completely different set of surroundings and culture from what you are accustomed to in your life on the surface. You really have to see it for yourself to be able to believe it. Question, will I myself see it sometime? Answer, who knows, maybe. Time brings new opportunities. Question, how many creatures of your kind live in this colony? Answer, approximately 900. Question, that is the end of the interview. Do you have any final message for the readers of the transcript? Answer, yes. I am thoroughly surprised at the many comments to my words, of course. I am naturally also disappointed about the religious portrayals of me as the enemy which have been voiced and which have buried themselves deeply in your mind. You should learn to set yourselves apart from the old conditioning and not to stand quasi under the control of something or someone who has already been gone for 5,000 years. You are, after all, free spirits. Those are my final words.